Hey Alpha Nurses, I'm Nurse Andrew from AlphaNurseGuide.com. This is NCLEX Peer Review Lesson 40, 125 Practice Questions. You can get my notes on Etsy. Be sure to follow my store to get any updates of new notes. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok to get any updates. All links are in the description. Without the way, let's get started. The nurse witnesses a client sustain a fall and suspects that the client's leg may be fractured. Which action is the priority? A. Take a set of vital signs. B. Call the radiology department. C. Immobilize the leg before moving the client. D. Reassure the client that everything will be fine. The correct answer is C. Immobilize the leg before moving the client. Rationale When a fracture is suspected, it is imperative that the area is splinted before the client is moved. Emergency help should be called, if the client is not hospitalized, a healthcare provider is called for the hospitalized client. The nurse should remain with the client and provide realistic reassurance. The nurse does not prescribe radiology tests. The nurse is evaluating the pin sites of a client in skeletal traction. The nurse would be least concerned with which finding. A. Inflammation b serous drainage c pain at a pin site d purulent drainage the correct answer is b serous drainage rationale a small amount of serous drainage is expected at pin insertion sites signs of infection such as inflammation purulent drainage and pain at the pin site are not expected findings and should be reported The nurse witness a vehicle hitting a pedestrian. The individual is dazed and tries to get up, and the leg appears fractured. The nurse should plan to perform which action? A. Try to manually reduce the fracture. B. Assist the person to get up and walk to the sidewalk. C. Leave the person for a few moments to call an ambulance. D. Stay with the person and encourage the person to remain still. The correct answer is D. Stay with the person and encourage the person to remain still. Rationale With a suspected fracture, the client is not moved unless it is dangerous to remain in that spot. The nurse should remain with the client and have someone else call for emergency help. A fracture is not reduced at the scene. Before moving the client, the site of the fracture is immobilized to prevent further injury. A client with a hip fracture asks the nurse why Buck's extension traction is being applied before surgery. The nurse's response is based on the understanding that Buck's extension traction has which primary function? A. Allows bony healing to begin before surgery. B. Provides rigid immobilization of the fracture site. C. Lengthens the fractured leg to prevent severing of blood vessels. D. Provides comfort by reducing muscle spasms and provides fracture immobilization. The correct answer is D. Provides comfort by reducing muscle spasms and provides fracture immobilization. Rationale Buck's extension traction is a type of skin traction, often applied after hip fracture, before the fracture is reduced in surgery. It reduces muscle spasms and helps immobilize the fracture. It does not lengthen the leg for the purpose of preventing blood vessel severance. It also does not allow for bony healing to begin. The nurse is caring for the client, who has had skeletal traction applied to the left leg. The client is complaining of severe left leg pain. Which action should the nurse take first? A. Provide pin care. B. Call the health care provider. C. Check the client's alignment in bed. D. Medicate the client with an analgesic. The correct answer is C. Check the client's alignment in bed. Rationale A client who complains of severe pain may need realignment or may have had traction weights prescribed that are too heavy. The nurse realigns the client and, if ineffective, calls the HCP. Severe leg pain, once traction has been established, indicates a problem. Medicating the client should be done after trying to determine and treat the cause. 
Providing pin care is unrelated to the problem as described. The nurse has provided instructions regarding specific leg exercises for the client, immobilized in right skeletal lower leg traction. The nurse determines that the client needs further teaching if the nurse observes the client doing which activity. A. Pulling up on the trapeze. B. Flexing and extending the feet. C. Doing quadriceps setting and gluteal setting exercises. D. Performing active range of motion to the right ankle and knee. The correct answer is D. Performing active range of motion to the right ankle and knee. Rationale, exercise is indicated within therapeutic limits for the client in skeletal traction to maintain muscle strength and range of motion. The client may pull up on the trapeze, perform active range of motion with uninvolved joints, and do isometric muscle setting exercises. The client may also flex and extend his or her feet. Performing active range of motion to the affected leg can be harmful. The nurse is checking the casted extremity of a client. The nurse should check for which sign, indicative of infection. A. Dependent edema. B. Diminished distal pulse. C. Presence of a hot spot on the cast. D. Coolness and pallor of the extremity. The correct answer is C. Presence of a hot spot on the cast. Rationale. Signs and symptoms of infection under a casted area include odor or purulent drainage from the cast or the presence of hot spots, which are areas of the cast that are warmer than others. The healthcare provider should be notified if any of these occur. Signs of impaired circulation in the distal limb include coolness and pallor of the skin, diminished arterial pulse, and edema. A client has sustained a closed fracture and has just had a cast applied to the affected arm. The client is complaining of intense pain. The nurse has elevated the limb, applied an ice bag, and administered an analgesic, which was ineffective in relieving the pain. The nurse interprets that this pain may be caused by which condition? A. Infection under the cast. B. The anxiety of the client. C. Impaired tissue perfusion. D. The newness of the fracture. The correct answer is C. Impaired tissue perfusion. Rationale, most pain associated with fractures can be minimized with rest, elevation, application of a cold compress, and administration of analgesics. Pain that is not relieved from these measures should be reported to the healthcare provider because it may be the result of impaired tissue perfusion, tissue breakdown, or necrosis. Because this is a new closed fracture and cast, infection would not have had time to set in. The nurse is assigned to care for a client with multiple traumas who is admitted to the hospital. The client has a leg fracture and a plaster cast has been applied. In positioning the casted leg, the nurse should perform which intervention? A. Keep the leg in a level position. B. Elevate the leg for three hours and put it flat for one hour. C. Keep the leg level for three hours and elevate it for one hour. D. Elevate the leg on pillows continuously for 24 to 48 hours. The correct answer is D. Elevate the leg on pillows continuously for 24 to 48 hours. Rationale, a casted extremity is elevated continuously for the first 24 to 48 hours to minimize swelling and to promote venous drainage. Therefore, the other options are incorrect. A client is complaining of skin irritation from the edges of a cast applied the previous day. The nurse should plan for which intervention? A. Massaging the skin at the rim of the cast. B. Pedaling the cast edges with adhesive tape. C. Using a rough file to smooth the cast edges. D. Applying lotion to the skin at the rim of the cast. The correct answer is B. Pedaling the cast edges with adhesive tape. Rationale, the edges of the cast can be pedaled with tape to minimize skin irritation. If a client has a cast applied and returns home, the client can be taught to do the same. Massaging and applying lotion 
will not alleviate the skin irritation from the cast edges. Filing the edges will cause cast material to fall into the cast and could lead to skin irritation under the cast. After a liver biopsy, the nurse should place the client in which position? A. Trendelenburg and on the left side. B. Prone with the head of the bed, in a flat position. C. Supine with the head of the bed, at a 30-degree angle. D. A right side lying position, with a small pillow or folded towel under the puncture site. The correct answer is D. A right side lying position with a small pillow or folded towel under the puncture site. Rationale, after a liver biopsy, the client is assisted with assuming a right side lying position with a small pillow or folded towel under the puncture site for at least three hours. Options A, B, and C are incorrect positions. The nurse is assisting with the insertion of a nasogastric tube into a client. The nurse should place the client in which position for insertion? A. Right side. B. Low Fowler's position. C. High Fowler's position. D. Supine, with the head flat. The correct answer is C. High Fowler's position. Rationale During the insertion of a nasogastric tube, the client is placed in a sitting or high Fowler's position to reduce the risk of pulmonary aspiration if the client should vomit. Options A, B, and D do not facilitate the insertion of the tube or prevent aspiration. The nurse is checking a client for the correct placement of a nasogastric tube. The nurse aspirates the client's stomach contents and checks its pH level. Which pH value indicates the correct placement of the tube? A. 3.5 B. 4.5 C. 6.0 D. 7.35 The correct answer is A. 3.5 Rationale, if the NG tube is in the stomach, the pH of the contents will be acidic. Options B and C indicate a slightly acidic pH. Option D indicates a neutral pH. The nurse is preparing to assist with removing a nasogastric tube from the client. The nurse should reinforce instructing the client to perform which action? A. Exhale. B. Inhale and exhale quickly. C. Take and hold a deep breath. D. Perform Valsalva's maneuver. The correct answer is C. Take and hold a deep breath. Rationale When the NG tube is removed, the client is instructed to take and hold a deep breath. This will close the epiglottis and the airway will be temporarily obstructed during the tube removal. This allows for the easy withdrawal of the tube through the esophagus into the nose. The tube is removed with one very smooth, continuous pull. Options A, B, and D are incorrect. The nurse is caring for a client with a diagnosis of chronic gastritis. The nurse anticipates that the client is at risk for which vitamin deficiency? A. Vitamin A B. Vitamin C C. Vitamin E D. Vitamin B12 The correct answer is D. Vitamin B12 Rationale, deterioration and atrophy of the lining of the stomach lead to the loss of function of the parietal cells. When the acid secretion decreases, the source of the intrinsic factor is lost, which results in the inability to absorb vitamin B12. This leads to the development of pernicious anemia. Options A, B, and C are incorrect. The nurse is caring for a client after a bill wrote to procedure. On review of the postoperative prescriptions, which should the nurse clarify? A. Leg exercises. B. Early ambulation. C. Irrigating the nasogastric tube. D. Coughing and deep breathing exercises. The correct answer is C. Irrigating the nasogastric tube. Rationale In a bill wrote to resection, the proximal remnant of the stomach is anastomosed to the proximal jejunum. 
patency of the NG tube is critical for preventing the retention of gastric secretions. The nurse, however, should never irrigate or reposition the gastric tube after gastric surgery unless specifically prescribed by the healthcare provider. In this situation, the nurse should clarify the prescription. Options A, B, and D are appropriate postoperative interventions. The nurse is reinforcing discharge instructions to a client after a gastrectomy. Which measure should the nurse include in client teaching to help prevent dumping syndrome? A. Ambulate after a meal. B. Eat high-carbohydrate foods. C. Limit the fluids taken with meals. D. Sit in a high fowler's position during meals. The correct answer is C. Limit the fluids taken with meals. Rationale, the client should be instructed to decrease the amount of fluid taken at meals. The client should also be instructed to avoid high-carbohydrate foods, including fluids such as fruit nectars, assume a low fowler's position during meals, lie down for 30 minutes after eating, to delay gastric emptying, and take antispasmodics as prescribed. The nurse is monitoring a client for the early signs and symptoms of dumping syndrome, which indicates this occurrence. A. Sweating and pallor. B. Dry skin and stomach pain. C. Bradycardia and indigestion. D. Double vision and chest pain. The correct answer is A. Sweating and pallor. Rationale, early manifestations occur 5 to 30 minutes after eating. Symptoms include vertigo, tachycardia, syncope, sweating, pallor, palpitations, and the desire to lie down. The nurse is reviewing the record of a client with Crohn's disease. Which stool characteristic should the nurse expect to see documented in the record? A. Diarrhea B. Constipation C. Bloody stools D. Stool constantly oozing The correct answer is A. Diarrhea Rationale, Crohn's disease is characterized by non-bloody diarrhea of usually not more than four or five stools daily. Over time, the diarrhea episodes increase in frequency, duration, and severity. Options B, C, and D are not characteristics of Crohn's disease. The nurse is reviewing the prescriptions of a client admitted to the hospital with a diagnosis of acute pancreatitis. Which interventions should the nurse expect to note? Select all that apply. A. Administer antacids as prescribed. B. Encourage small, frequent, high-calorie feedings. C. Encourage coughing and deep breathing. D. Administer anticholinergics as prescribed. E. Maintain the client in a supine and flat position. The correct answers are A. Administer antacids as prescribed. C. Encourage coughing and deep breathing. And D. Administer anticholinergics as prescribed. Rationale. Abdominal pain is a prominent symptom of pancreatitis, pain medication will be prescribed. Some clients experience lessened pain by assuming positions that flex the trunk and draw the knees up to the chest. A side-lying position, with the head elevated 45 degrees, decreases tension on the abdomen and may also help ease the pain. The client is susceptible to respiratory infections because the retroperitoneal fluid raises the diaphragm which causes the client to take shallow, guarded abdominal breaths. Therefore, measures such as turning, coughing, and deep breathing are instituted. Antacids and anticholinergics may be prescribed to suppress GI secretions. A client is to begin a six-month course of therapy with isoniazid. The nurse should plan to provide which information to the client. A. Drink alcohol in small amounts only. B. Report yellow eyes or skin immediately. C. Increase intake of Swiss or aged cheeses. D. Avoid vitamin supplements during therapy. The correct answer is B. Report yellow eyes or skin immediately. Rationale, isoniazid is hepatotoxic and therefore the client is taught to report signs and symptoms of hepatitis immediately. 
For the same reason, alcohol should be avoided during therapy. The client should avoid intake of Swiss cheese, fish such as tuna, and foods containing tyramine, because they may cause a reaction characterized by redness and itching of the skin, flushing, sweating, tachycardia, headache or lightheadedness. The client can avoid developing peripheral neuritis by increasing the intake of pyridoxine during the course of isoniazid therapy. A client has been started on long-term therapy with rifampin. Which information about this medication should the nurse provide to the client? A. Should always be taken with food or antacids. B. Should be double-dosed if one dose is forgotten. C. Causes orange discoloration of sweat, tears, and urine. D. May be discontinued independently if symptoms are gone in three months. The correct answer is C. Causes orange discoloration of sweat, tears, and urine. Rationale, rifampin should be taken exactly as directed. Doses should not be doubled or skipped. The client should not stop therapy until directed to do so by a healthcare provider. The medication should be administered on an empty stomach unless it causes gastrointestinal upset and then it may be taken with food. Antacids, if prescribed, should be taken at least one hour before the medication. Rifampin causes orange-red discoloration of body secretions and will permanently stain soft contact lenses. The nurse has given a client taking ethambutol information about the medication. The nurse determines that the client understands the instructions if the client states to report which occurrence immediately. A. Impaired sense of hearing. B. Problems with visual acuity. C. Gastrointestinal side effects. D. Red-orange discoloration of body secretions. The correct answer is B. Problems with visual acuity. Rationale, ethambutol causes optic neuritis, which decreases visual acuity and the ability to discriminate between the colors red and green. This poses a potential safety hazard when a client is driving a motor vehicle. The client is taught to report this symptom immediately. The client is also taught to take the medication with food if gastrointestinal upset occurs. Impaired hearing results from anti-tubercular therapy with streptomycin. Red-orange discoloration of secretions occurs with rifampin. Cycloserine is added to the medication regimen for a client with tuberculosis. Which instruction should the nurse reinforce in the client teaching plan regarding this medication? A. To take the medication before meals. B. To return to the clinic weekly for serum drug level testing. C. It is not necessary to restrict alcohol intake with this medication. D. It is not necessary to call the healthcare provider if a skin rash occurs. The correct answer is B. To return to the clinic weekly for serum drug level testing. Rationale, cycloserine is an anti-tubercular medication that requires weekly serum drug level determinations to monitor for the potential of neurotoxicity. Serum drug levels lower than 30 microgram per milliliter reduce the incidence of neurotoxicity. The medication must be taken after meals to prevent gastrointestinal irritation. The client must be instructed to notify the healthcare provider if a skin rash or signs of central nervous system toxicity are noted. Alcohol must be avoided because it increases the risk of seizure activity. A client with tuberculosis is being started on anti-tuberculosis therapy with isoniazid. Before giving the client the first dose, the nurse ensures that which baseline study has been completed. A. Electrolyte levels. B. Coagulation times. C. Liver enzyme levels. D. Serum creatinine level. The correct answer is C. Liver enzyme levels. Rationale, isoniazid therapy can cause an elevation of hepatic enzyme levels and hepatitis. Therefore, liver enzyme levels are monitored when therapy is initiated and during the first three months of therapy. They may be monitored longer in the client who is greater than age 50 or excessively drink alcohol. 
A client is receiving acetylcysteine, 20% solution diluted in 0.9% normal saline, by nebulizer. The nurse should have which item available, for a possible adverse event, after giving this medication. A. Ombu bag. B. Intubation tray. C. Nasogastric tube. D. Suction equipment. The correct answer is D. Suction equipment. Rationale. Acetylcysteine can be given orally or by nasogastric tube to treat acetaminophen overdose, or it may be given by inhalation for use as a mucolytic. The nurse administering this medication as a mucolytic should have suction equipment available in case the client cannot manage to clear the increased volume of liquefied secretions. The nurse reinforces client instructions about ethambutol. The nurse determines that the client understands the instructions if the client indicates to report which occurrence. A. Impaired sense of hearing. B. Distressing gastrointestinal side effects. C. Orange-red discoloration of body secretions. D. Difficulty discriminating the color red from green. The correct answer is D. Difficulty discriminating the color red from green. Rationale, ethambutol causes optic neuritis, which decreases visual acuity and the ability to discriminate between the colors red and green. This poses a potential safety hazard when driving a motor vehicle. The client is taught to report this symptom immediately. The client is also taught to take the medication with food if gastrointestinal upset occurs. Impaired hearing results from anti-tubercular therapy with streptomycin. Orange-red discoloration of secretions occurs with rifampin. The nurse has a prescription to give a client albuterol and beclomethasone dipropionate by metered dose inhaler. How should the nurse administer these medications? A. Give albuterol first and then the beclomethasone dipropionate. B. Distressing gastrointestinal side effects. C. Have the client alternate a single puff of each, beginning with the albuterol. D. Have the client alternate a single puff of each, beginning with the beclomethasone dipropionate. The correct answer is A. Give albuterol first, and then the beclomethasone dipropionate. Rationale Albuterol is a bronchodilator. Beclomethasone dipropionate is a glucocorticoid. Bronchodilators are always administered before glucocorticoids when both are to be given on the same time schedule. This allows for widening of the air passages by the bronchodilator, which then makes the glucocorticoid more effective. A client has begun therapy with theophylline. The nurse tells the client to limit the intake of which of the following items while taking this medication. A. Oranges and pineapple. B. Coffee, cola, and chocolate. C. Oysters, lobster, and shrimp. D. Cottage cheese, cream cheese, and dairy creamers. The correct answer is B. Coffee, cola, and chocolate. Rationale Theophylline is a xanthine bronchodilator. The nurse teaches the client to limit the intake of xanthine containing foods while taking this medication. These include coffee, cola, and chocolate. A client with a prescription to take theophylline daily has been given medication instructions by the nurse. The nurse determines that the client needs further teaching about the medication if the client makes which statement. A. I will take the daily dose at bedtime. B. I will drink at least 2 liters of fluid per day. C. I will avoid over-the-counter cough and cold medications unless approved by the healthcare provider. D. I will avoid changing brands of the medication without healthcare provider approval. The correct answer is A. I will take the daily dose at bedtime. Rationale: The client taking a single daily dose of theophylline, a xanthine bronchodilator, should take the medication early in the morning. This enables the client to have maximal benefit from the medication during daytime activities. In addition, this medication causes insomnia. The client should take in at least 2 liters of fluid per day to decrease viscosity of secretions. 
the client should check with the healthcare provider before changing brands of the medication. The client also checks with the healthcare provider before taking over the counter cough, cold, or other respiratory preparations because they could cause interactive effects, increasing the side effects of theophylline and causing dysrhythmias. The nurse is reading the healthcare provider's progress notes in the client's record and sees that the HCP has documented insensible fluid loss of approximately 800 ml daily. Which client is at risk for this loss? A. A client with a Jackson Pratt drain. B. A client with a urinary catheter. C. A client with a fast respiratory rate. D. A client with a nasogastric tube set to low suction. The correct answer is C. A client with a fast respiratory rate. Rationale. Sensible losses are those that the person is aware of, such as those that occur through wound drainage, GI tract losses, and urination. Insensible losses may occur without the person's awareness. Insensible losses occur daily through the skin and the lungs. The nurse is reviewing the health records of assigned clients. The nurse should plan care, knowing that which client is at the least likely risk for the development of third spacing. A. The client with sepsis. B. The client with cirrhosis. C. The client with kidney failure. D. The client with diabetes mellitus. The correct answer is D. The client with diabetes mellitus. Rationale. Fluid that shifts into the interstitial spaces and remains there is referred to as third space fluid. Common sites for third spacing include the abdomen, pleural cavity, peritoneal cavity, and pericardial sac. Third space fluid is physiologically useless because it does not circulate to provide nutrients for the cells. Risk factors include liver or kidney disease, major trauma, burns, sepsis, wound healing, major surgery, malignancy, malabsorption syndrome, malnutrition, alcoholism, and older age. The nurse is reviewing the health records of assigned clients. The nurse should plan care knowing that which client is at risk for fluid volume deficit. A. The client with cirrhosis. B. The client with a colostomy. C. The client with heart failure. D. The client with decreased kidney function. The correct answer is B. The client with a colostomy. Rationale. Causes of a fluid volume deficit include vomiting, diarrhea, conditions that cause increased respirations, or increased urinary output, insufficient intravenous fluid replacement, draining fistulas, ileostomy, and colostomy. A client with cirrhosis, heart failure, or decreased kidney function is at risk for fluid volume excess. The nurse is caring for a client who has been taking diuretics on a long-term basis. Which findings should the nurse expect to note as a result of this long-term use? A. Gurgling respirations. B. Increased blood pressure. C. Decreased hematocrit level. D. Increased specific gravity of the urine. The correct answer is D. Increased specific gravity of the urine. Rationale. Clients taking diuretics on a long-term basis are at risk for fluid volume deficit. Findings of fluid volume deficit include increased respirations and heart rate, decreased central venous pressure, weight loss, poor skin turgor, dry mucous membranes, decreased urine volume, increased specific gravity of the urine, dark colored and odorous urine, an increased hematocrit level, and an altered level of consciousness. Gurgling respirations, increased blood pressure, and decreased hematocrit as a result of hemodilution are seen in a client with fluid volume excess. The nurse reviews electrolyte values and notes a sodium level of 130 milliequivalents per liter. The nurse expects that this sodium level would be noted in a client with which condition? A. The client with watery diarrhea. B. The client with diabetes insipidus. C. The client with an inadequate daily water intake. D. The client with the syndrome of inappropriate secretion of antidiuretic hormone. The correct answer is D, the client with the syndrome of inappropriate secretion of antidiuretic hormone. 
Rationale, hyponatremia, is a serum sodium level less than 135 milliequivalents per liter. Hyponatremia can occur secondary to syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion. The client with an inadequate daily water intake, watery diarrhea, or diabetes insipidus, is at risk for hypernatremia. The nurse is caring for a client with leukemia and notes that the client has poor skin turgor and flat neck and hand veins. The nurse suspects hyponatremia. Which additional signs slash symptoms should the nurse expect to note in this client if hyponatremia is present? A. Intense thirst. B. Slow bounding pulse. C. Dry mucous membranes. D. Postural blood pressure changes. The correct answer is D. Postural blood pressure changes. Rationale, postural blood pressure changes occur in the client with hyponatremia. Intense thirst and dry mucous membranes are seen in clients with hypernatremia. A slow, bounding pulse is not indicative of hyponatremia. In a client with hyponatremia, a rapid, thready pulse is noted. The nurse is caring for a client with a diagnosis of hyperparathyroidism. Laboratory studies are performed and the serum calcium level is 12.0 mg per deciliter. Based on this laboratory value, the nurse should take which action? A. Document the value in the client's record. B. Inform the doctor of the laboratory value. C. Place the laboratory result form in the client's record. D. Reassure the client that the laboratory result is normal. The correct answer is B. Inform the doctor of the laboratory value. Rationale, the normal serum calcium level ranges from 8.6 to 10.0 mg per deciliter. The client is experiencing hypercalcemia, and the nurse would inform the doctor of the laboratory value. Because the client is experiencing hypercalcemia, the remaining options are incorrect actions. The nurse reviews the client's serum calcium level and notes that the level is 8.0 mg per deciliter. The nurse understands which condition causes the serum calcium level. A. Prolonged bed rest. B. Adrenal insufficiency. C. Hyperparathyroidism. D. Excessive ingestion of vitamin D. The correct answer is A. Prolonged bed rest. Rationale, the normal serum calcium level is 8.6 to 10.0 mg per deciliter. A client with a serum calcium level of 8.0 mg per deciliter is experiencing hypocalcemia. The excessive ingestion of vitamin D, adrenal insufficiency, and hyperparathyroidism are causative factors associated with hypercalcemia. Although immobilization can initially cause hypercalcemia, the long-term effect of prolonged bed rest is hypocalcemia. The nurse is caring for a client with a suspected diagnosis of hypercalcemia. Which sign slash symptom is an indication of this electrolyte imbalance? A. Twitching. B. Positive Trousseau's sign. C. Hyperactive bowel sounds. D. Generalized muscle weakness. The correct answer is D. Generalized muscle weakness. Rationale, generalized muscle weakness is seen in clients with hypercalcemia. Twitching, positive trousseau's sign, and hyperactive bowel sounds are signs of hypocalcemia. The nurse is instructing a client on how to decrease the intake of calcium in the diet. The nurse should tell the client that which food item is least likely to contain calcium. A. Milk. B. Butter. C. Spinach. D. Collard greens. The correct answer is B. Butter. Rationale, butter comes from milk fat and does not contain significant amounts of calcium. Milk, spinach, and collard greens are calcium-containing foods and should be avoided by the client on a calcium-restricted diet. The nurse is reviewing the laboratory results of a client receiving chemotherapy. The nurse prepares to initiate neutropenic precautions 
when the nurse notes which laboratory result. A. A bleeding time of 3 minutes. B. An ammonia level of 20 micrograms per deciliter. C. A platelet count of 200,000 cells per cubic millimeter. D. A white blood cell count of 2,000 cells per cubic millimeter. The correct answer is D. A white blood cell count of 2,000 cells per cubic millimeter. Rationale The normal white blood cell count is 5,000 to 10,000 cells per cubic millimeter. When the white blood cell count drops, neutropenic precautions need to be implemented. This includes protective isolation measures to protect the client from infection. Bleeding precautions need to be initiated when the platelet count drops. Bleeding precautions include avoiding all trauma such as rectal temperatures or injections. The normal platelet count is 150,000 to 450,000 cells per cubic millimeter. The normal bleeding time is 1 to 6 minutes, depending on laboratory method used. The normal ammonia value is 10 to 80 micrograms per deciliter. A client has experienced several episodes of sickle cell crisis. Which reinforced instruction should be included in the client's teaching plan to prevent recurrence? A. Vigorous exercise is encouraged to maintain cardiovascular function. B. Ice liquids will combat dehydration and should be consumed regularly. C. Wear shoes and socks when walking outside to prevent damage to the feet. D. To prevent opioid tolerance, avoid taking pain medication at the beginning of the crisis. The correct answer is C. Wear shoes and socks when walking outside to prevent damage to the feet. Rationale Wearing socks and shoes will prevent wounds to the legs and feet, which heal slowly and frequently become infected in clients with sickle cell disease. Vigorous exercise and iced liquids can precipitate a crisis and should be avoided. Opioid tolerance is not a priority or immediate concern for clients experiencing a sickle cell crisis. These clients experience a great deal of pain and require opioids for pain relief. The nurse is doing discharge teaching with a client who has sickle cell disease. The nurse reinforces instructions to the client to avoid which factor that could precipitate a sickle cell crisis. A. Infection B. Mild exercise C. Fluid overload D. Warm weather The correct answer is A. Infection Rationale The client should avoid infections which can increase metabolic demand and cause dehydration, precipitating a sickle cell crisis. The client should also avoid dehydration from other causes. Warm weather and mild exercise do not need to be avoided, but the client should take measures to avoid dehydration during these conditions. Fluids are important to prevent dehydration. Finally, the client should avoid being in areas of high altitude or flying in a non-pressurized aircraft because of lesser oxygen tension in these areas. The nurse is caring for a client with a suspected diagnosis of aplastic anemia. Which tests should the nurse anticipate to be performed to confirm the diagnosis? A. Schilling test B. Sickle cell screen C. Bone marrow aspiration D. Complete blood cell count The correct answer is C, bone marrow aspiration. Rationale, a bone marrow aspiration will identify aplastic anemia and will identify pancytopenia, a deficiency in erythrocytes, leukocytes, and thrombocytes. A Schilling test is diagnostic for pernicious anemia. A sickle cell screen is diagnostic for sickle cell anemia. A complete blood cell count will identify anemia but may not identify the specific type. A client with sickle cell disease has been admitted to the hospital complaining of a sudden onset of severe pain in the extremities, abdomen, back and chest. In which priority order should the nurse perform the actions listed? Arrange the actions in the order they should be performed. All options must be used. A. Administer an opioid analgesic. B. Hydrate the client with normal saline 0.9%. 
C. Administer oxygen. D. Keep room temperature at or above 72 degrees. E. Encourage the client to keep extremities extended. The correct order is C. Administer oxygen. A. Administer an opioid analgesic. B. Hydrate the client with normal saline 0.9%. E. Encourage the client to keep extremities extended, and then, D. Keep room temperature at or above 72 degrees. Rationale. A client in a sickle cell crisis will have pain as the body's tissues become hypoxic. Oxygenation is important, so oxygen is applied first. To decrease the pain from the sickling process, the client is given an opioid analgesic. The client is then started on an isotonic solution to help prevent further sickling. Keeping the extremities extended and not bent decreases sickling risk, as does keeping the room warm. The nurse is reinforcing instructions to a client with iron deficiency anemia about iron-rich foods. Which food sources should the nurse include in the discharge teaching plan of a client with iron deficiency anemia? Select all that apply. A. Milk. B. Fish. C. Eggs. D. Liver. E. Cheese. The correct answers are C. Eggs and D. Liver. Rationale. Liver and muscle meats, eggs, dried fruits, and dark green, leafy vegetables are iron-rich foods. Milk, fish, and cheese are not significant sources of iron. The client has been on treatment for rheumatoid arthritis for three weeks. During the administration of Adenercept, it is most important for the nurse to collect which data. A. The injection site for itching and edema. B. The white blood cell counts and platelet counts. C. A metallic taste in the mouth with a loss of appetite. D. Whether the client is experiencing fatigue and joint pain. The correct answer is B, the white blood cell counts and platelet counts. Rationale, infection and suppression can occur as a result of Adenercept. Laboratory studies are performed before and during medication treatment. The appearance of abnormal white blood cell counts and abnormal platelet counts can alert the nurse to a potentially life-threatening infection or potential bleeding. Injection site itching and edema are common occurrences following administration. A metallic taste and loss of appetite are not associated with this medication. Fatigue and joint pain occur with rheumatoid arthritis. Alendronate is prescribed for a client with osteoporosis and the nurse is providing instructions on administration of the medication. Which instruction should the nurse reinforce? A. Take the medication at bedtime. B. Take the medication in the morning with breakfast. C. Lie down for 30 minutes after taking the medication. D. Take the medication with a full glass of water after rising in the morning. The correct answer is D. Take the medication with a full glass of water after rising in the morning. Rationale. Precautions need to be taken with the administration of alendronate to prevent gastrointestinal side slash adverse effects and to increase absorption of the medication. The medication needs to be taken with a full glass of water after rising in the morning. The client should not eat or drink anything for 30 minutes following administration and should not lie down after taking the medication. The nurse is monitoring a client receiving baclofen for side effects related to the medication, which should indicate that the client is experiencing a side effect. A. Polyuria. B. Diarrhea. C. Drowsiness. D. Muscular excitability. The correct answer is C. Drowsiness. Rationale, baclofen is a central nervous system depressant and frequently causes drowsiness, dizziness, weakness, and fatigue. It can also cause nausea, constipation, and urinary retention. Clients should be warned about the possible reactions. Options A, B, and D are not side effects. In monitoring a client's response to disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, 
which findings should the nurse interpret as acceptable responses. Select all that apply. A. Symptom control during periods of emotional stress. B. Normal white blood cell, platelet, and neutrophil counts. C. Radiological findings that show non-progression of joint degeneration. D. An increased range of motion in the affected joints, three months into therapy. E. Inflammation and irritation at the injection site three days after injection is given. F. A low-grade temperature upon rising in the morning that remains throughout the day. The correct answers are A. Symptom control during periods of emotional stress, B. Normal white blood cell, platelet, and neutrophil counts, C. Radiological findings that show non-progression of joint degeneration, and D. An increased range of motion in the affected joints three months into therapy. Rationale, because emotional stress frequently exacerbates the symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis, the absence of symptoms is a positive finding. Disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs are given to slow progression of joint degeneration. In addition, the improvement in the range of motion after three months of therapy with normal blood work is a positive finding. Temperature elevation and inflammation and irritation at the medication injection site could indicate signs of infection. A client with acute muscle spasms has been taking baclofen. The client calls the clinic nurse because of continuous feelings of weakness and fatigue and asks the nurse about discontinuing the medication. The nurse should make which appropriate response to the client. A. You should never stop the medication. B. It is best that you taper the dose if you intend to stop the medication. C. It is okay to stop the medication if you think that you can tolerate the muscle spasms. D. Weakness and fatigue commonly occur and will diminish with continued medication use. The correct answer is D. Weakness and fatigue commonly occur and will diminish with continued medication use. Rationale The client should be instructed that symptoms such as drowsiness, weakness, and fatigue are more intense in the early phase of therapy and diminish with continued medication use. The client should be instructed never to withdraw or stop the medication abruptly because abrupt withdrawal can cause visual hallucinations, paranoid ideation, and seizures. It is best for the nurse to inform the client that these symptoms will subside and encourage the client to continue the use of the medication. The nurse is reviewing the laboratory studies on a client receiving dantrolene sodium. Which laboratory test would identify an adverse effect associated with the administration of this medication? A. Creatinine. B. Liver function tests. C. Blood urea nitrogen. D. Hematological function tests. The correct answer is B. Liver function tests. Rationale Dose related liver damage is the most serious adverse effect of dantrolene. To reduce the risk of liver damage, liver function tests should be performed before treatment and periodically throughout the treatment course. It is administered in the lowest effective dosage for the shortest time necessary. Options A and C are tests that assess kidney function. The nurse is reviewing the record of a client who has been prescribed baclofen. Which disorder should alert the nurse to contact the healthcare provider? A. Seizure disorders. B. Hyperthyroidism. C. Diabetes mellitus. D. Coronary artery disease. The correct answer is A. Seizure disorders. Rationale Clients with seizure disorders may have a lowered seizure threshold when baclofen is administered. Concurrent therapy may require an increase in the anticonvulsive medication. The disorders in options B, C, and D are not a concern when the client is taking baclofen. Cyclobenzaprine is prescribed for a client to treat muscle spasms and the nurse is reviewing the client's record. Which disorder would indicate a need to contact the health care provider regarding the administration of this medication? A. Glaucoma B. Emphysema C. Hyperthyroidism D. Diabetes mellitus The correct answer is A. Glaucoma 
Rationale, because this medication has anticholinergic effects, it should be used with caution in clients, with a history of urinary retention, angle closure glaucoma, and increased intraocular pressure. Cyclobenzaprine hydrochloride should be used only for short term, such as a two to three weeks therapy. The disorders in options B, C, and D are not a concern when the client is taking cyclobenzaprine. Dantrolene sodium is prescribed for a client experiencing flexor spasms, and the client asks the nurse about the action of the medication. The nurse responds knowing that, which is the therapeutic action of this medication. A. Depresses spinal reflexes. B. Acts directly on the skeletal muscle to relieve spasticity. C. Acts within the spinal cord to suppress hyperactive reflexes. D. Acts on the central nervous system to suppress spasms. The correct answer is B. Acts directly on the skeletal muscle to relieve spasticity. Rationale, Dantrolene, acts directly on skeletal muscle to relieve muscle spasticity. The primary action is the suppression of calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This in turn decreases the ability of the skeletal muscle to contract. Options A, C, and D are not actions of the medication. The nurse is reinforcing discharge instructions to a client receiving baclofen. Which should the nurse include in the instructions? A. Restrict fluid intake. B. Avoid the use of alcohol. C. Stop the medication if diarrhea occurs. D. Notify the healthcare provider if fatigue occurs. The correct answer is B. Avoid the use of alcohol. Rationale Baclofen is a central nervous system depressant. The client should be cautioned against the use of alcohol and other central nervous system depressants because baclofen potentiates the depressant activity of these agents. It is not necessary to restrict fluids, but the client should be warned that urinary retention can occur. Constipation rather than diarrhea is an adverse effect of baclofen. Fatigue is related to a CNS effect that is most intense during the early phase of therapy and diminishes with continued medication use. It is not necessary that the client notify the healthcare provider if fatigue occurs. The client who has a cold is seen in the emergency department with an inability to void. Because the client has a history of benign prostatic hyperplasia, the nurse determines that the client should be questioned about the use of which medication. A. Diuretics. B. Antibiotics. C. Antitussives. D. Decongestants. The correct answer is D. Decongestants. Rationale, episodes of urinary retention can be triggered by certain medications such as decongestants, anticholinergics, and antidepressants. Diuretics, antibiotics, and antitussives generally do not trigger urinary retention. Retention also can be precipitated by other factors such as alcoholic beverages, infection, bed rest, and becoming chilled. A sulfonamide is prescribed for a client with a urinary tract infection. On review of the client's record, the nurse notes that the client is taking warfarin sodium daily. Which prescription should the nurse anticipate for this client? A. Discontinuation of warfarin sodium b. A decrease in the warfarin sodium dosage c. An increase in the warfarin sodium dosage d. A decrease in the usual dose of sulfonamide The correct answer is b. A decrease in the warfarin sodium dosage Rationale, sulfonamides can potentiate the effects of warfarin sodium, phenytoin, and orally administered hypoglycemics, such as talbutamide. When an oral anticoagulant is combined with a sulfonamide, a decrease in the anticoagulant dosage may be needed. Methenamine, a urinary antiseptic, is prescribed for the client. The client's chart reads, blood glucose, 102 mg per deciliter, chest x-ray, normal, renal insufficiency, folic acid 0.5 mg, orally daily. The nurse reviews the client's medical record, and should contact the healthcare provider regarding which documented finding to verify the prescription. 
A. Renal insufficiency. B. Chest X-ray, normal. C. Blood glucose, 102 mg per deciliter. D. Folic acid, 0.5 mg, orally daily. The correct answer is A. Renal insufficiency. Rationale, methenamine is a urinary antiseptic. Methenamine can cause crystalluria and should not be used in clients with renal impairment. Therefore, the nurse would verify the prescription if the client had a documented history of renal insufficiency. The laboratory and diagnostic test results are normal findings. Folic acid may be prescribed for a client with renal insufficiency to prevent anemia. Trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole is prescribed for a client. The nurse should instruct the client to report which symptom, if it is developed during the course of this medication therapy. A. Nausea. B. Diarrhea. C. Headache. D. Sore throat. The correct answer is D. Sore throat. Rationale, clients taking trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole should be informed about early signs of blood disorders that can occur from this medication. These include sore throat, fever, and pallor. The client should be instructed to notify the health care provider if these symptoms occur. The other options do not require HCP notification. Phenazopyridine hydrochloride is prescribed for a client for symptomatic relief of pain, resulting from a lower urinary tract infection. Which should the nurse reinforce to the client? A. Take the medication at bedtime. B. Take the medication before meals. C. Discontinue the medication if a headache occurs. D. A reddish-orange discoloration of the urine may occur. The correct answer is D. A reddish-orange discoloration of the urine may occur. Rationale, the nurse should instruct the client that a reddish-orange discoloration of urine may occur. The nurse also should instruct the client that this discoloration can stain fabric. The medication should be taken after meals to reduce the possibility of gastrointestinal upset. A headache is an occasional side effect of the medication and does not warrant discontinuation of the medication. Bethanethyl chloride is prescribed for a client with urinary retention. Which disorder should be a contraindication to the administration of this medication? A. Gastric adenine. B. Urinary strictures. C. Neurogenic adenine. D. Gastroesophageal reflux. The correct answer is B. Urinary strictures. Rationale Bethanethyl chloride can be harmful to clients with urinary tract obstruction or weakness of the bladder wall. The medication has the ability to contract the bladder and thereby increase pressure within the urinary tract. Elevation of pressure within the urinary tract could rupture the bladder in clients with these conditions. The nurse who is administering bethanethyl chloride is monitoring for acute toxicity associated with the medication. The nurse should check the client for which sign of toxicity. A. Dry skin. B. Dry mouth. C. Bradycardia. D. Signs of dehydration. The correct answer is C. Bradycardia. Rationale Toxicity produces manifestations of excessive muscarinic stimulation, such as salivation, sweating, involuntary urination, and defecation, bradycardia, and severe hypotension. Treatment includes supportive measures and the administration of atropine sulfate subcutaneously or intravenously. Oxybutynin chloride is prescribed for a client with a neurogenic bladder. Which sign would indicate a possible toxic effect related to this medication? A. Pallor. B. Drowsiness. C. Bradycardia. D. Restlessness. The correct answer is D. Restlessness. Rationale Toxicity of this medication produces central nervous system excitation, such as nervousness, restlessness, hallucinations, and irritability. 
Other signs of toxicity include hypotension or hypertension, confusion, tachycardia, flushed or red face, and signs of respiratory depression. Drowsiness is a frequent side effect of the medication but does not indicate overdose. After kidney transplantation, cyclosporin is prescribed for a client. Which laboratory result would indicate an adverse effect from the use of this medication? A. Decreased creatinine level. B. Decreased hemoglobin level. C. Elevated white blood cell count. D. Elevated blood urea nitrogen level. The correct answer is D. Elevated blood urea nitrogen level. Rationale, nephrotoxicity can occur from the use of cyclosporin. Nephrotoxicity is evaluated by monitoring for elevated blood urea nitrogen and serum creatinine levels. Cyclosporin does not depress the bone marrow. A client has the following laboratory values, a pH of 7.55, an HCO3 level of 22 mm of mercury, and a PCO2 of 30 mm of mercury. Which action should the nurse take? A. Perform Allen's test. B. Prepare the client for dialysis. C. Administer insulin as prescribed. D. Encourage the client to slow down breathing. The correct answer is D. Encourage the client to slow down breathing. Rationale. The client is in respiratory alkalosis based on the laboratory results of a high pH and a low PCO2 level. Interventions for respiratory alkalosis are the voluntary holding of breath or slowed breathing and the rebreathing of exhaled CO2 by methods such as using a paper bag or a rebreathing mask as prescribed. Performing Allen's test would be incorrect because the blood specimen has already been drawn and the laboratory results have been completed. Dialysis and insulin administration are interventions for metabolic acidosis. The nurse is told that the blood gas results indicate a pH of 7.50 and a PCO2 of 32 mm of mercury. The nurse determines that these results are indicative of which acid-base disturbance? A. Metabolic acidosis. B. Metabolic alkalosis. C. Respiratory acidosis. D. Respiratory alkalosis. The correct answer is D, respiratory alkalosis. Rationale, the normal pH is 7.35 to 7.45. In a respiratory condition, an opposite relationship will be seen between the pH and the PCO2 as is seen in the correct option. In an alkalotic condition, the pH is increased. In an acidotic condition, the pH is decreased so both metabolic acidosis and respiratory acidosis can be eliminated. Metabolic alkalosis can also be eliminated because both pH and HCO3 are increased above normal values in this condition. The nurse is caring for a client with a nasogastric tube that is attached to low suction. The nurse monitors the client closely for which acid-base disorder that is most likely to occur in this situation. A. Metabolic acidosis. B. Metabolic alkalosis. C. Respiratory acidosis. D. Respiratory alkalosis. The correct answer is B. Metabolic alkalosis. Rationale The loss of gastric fluid via nasogastric suction, or vomiting, causes a metabolic condition. This also results in an alkalotic condition due to the loss of hydrochloric acid through gastrointestinal fluid losses. Also, the options denoting a respiratory problem, respiratory acidosis, and respiratory alkalosis can be easily eliminated. The nurse is caring for a client with severe diarrhea. The nurse monitors the client closely, understanding that this client is at risk for developing which acid-base disorder. A. Metabolic acidosis. B. Metabolic alkalosis. C. Respiratory acidosis. D. Respiratory alkalosis. The correct answer is A. Metabolic acidosis. Rationale Intestinal secretions high in bicarbonate 
may be lost through enteric drainage tubes, an ileostomy, or diarrhea. The decreased bicarbonate level creates the actual base deficit of metabolic acidosis. The remaining options are unlikely to occur in a client with severe diarrhea. The nurse is caring for a client with diabetic ketoacidosis and observes that the client is experiencing abnormally deep, regular, rapid respirations. How should the nurse correctly document this observation in the medical record? A. Apnea observed. B. Brady Nia noted. C. Cheney Stokes demonstrated. D. Kuzmal's respirations observed. The correct answer is D. Kuzmal's respirations observed. Rationale abnormally deep, regular, and rapid respirations observed in the client with diabetic ketoacidosis are documented as Kuzmal's respirations. In apnea, respirations cease for several seconds. In bradynia, respirations are regular but abnormally slow. Cheney Stokes respirations gradually become more shallow and are followed by periods of apnea with repetition of the pattern. The nurse is caring for a client with a diagnosis of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The nurse should monitor the client for which acid base imbalance. A. Metabolic acidosis. B. Metabolic alkalosis. C. Respiratory acidosis. D. Respiratory alkalosis. The correct answer is C. Respiratory acidosis. Rationale. Respiratory acidosis most often occurs as a result of primary defects in the function of the lungs or changes in normal respiratory patterns from secondary problems. Chronic respiratory acidosis is most commonly caused by COPD. Acute respiratory acidosis also occurs in clients with COPD when superimposed respiratory infection or concurrent respiratory disease increases the work of breathing. The remaining options are not likely to occur unless other conditions complicate the COPD. When caring for the following group of clients, who does the nurse determine is at risk for development of metabolic alkalosis? Select all that apply. A. Client with emphysema. B. Client who is hyperventilating. C. Client with chronic kidney disease. D. Client who has been vomiting for two days. E. Client receiving furosemide 40 mg daily. F. Client admitted with acetylsalicylic acid overdose. The correct answers are D. Client who has been vomiting for two days, and E. Client receiving furosemide 40 mg daily. Rationale Metabolic alkalosis is caused by any condition that creates the acid base imbalance through either an increase in bases or a deficit of acids such as the client who has been vomiting for two days and the client receiving furosemide daily. Recall that clients with emphysema and hyperventilation are at risk for a respiratory acid-base disturbance. Chronic kidney disease and aspirin overdose will result in metabolic acidosis. The nurse is caring for a client with respiratory insufficiency. The arterial blood gas results indicate a pH of 7.50, and a PCO2 of 30 mm of mercury, and the nurse is told that the client is experiencing respiratory alkalosis. Which additional laboratory value should the nurse expect to note? A. A sodium level of 145 milliequivalents per liter. B. A potassium level of 3.2 milliequivalents per liter. C. A magnesium level of 2.4 mg per deciliter. D. A phosphorus level of 4.0 mg per deciliter. The correct answer is B. A potassium level of 3.2 milliequivalents per liter. Rationale Signs slash symptoms of respiratory alkalosis include tachypnea, mental status changes, dizziness, pallor around the mouth, spasms of the muscles of the hands, and hypokalemia. The remaining options identify normal laboratory results. The charge nurse reviews the results of the arterial blood gases with the floor nurse and tells the floor nurse that the client is experiencing respiratory acidosis. The nurse should expect to note 
which on the laboratory result report. A pH 7.50, PCO2 52 mm of mercury. B pH 7.35, PCO2 40 mm of mercury. C pH 7.25, PCO2 50 mm of mercury. D pH 7.50, PCO2 30 mm of mercury. The correct answer is C, pH 7.25, PCO2 50 mm of mercury. Rationale, the normal pH is 7.35 to 7.45, and the normal PCO2 value is 35 to 45 mm of mercury. In respiratory acidosis, the pH is down, and the PCO2 is up. Therefore, the option with the pH of 7.25, and the PCO2 of 50 mm of mercury, is the only option that reflects an acidotic condition. Options with an elevated pH indicate an alkalotic condition. Option B identifies normal values for pH and PCO2. The nurse reviews the arterial blood gas results of a client and notes that the results indicate a pH of 7.30, PCO2 of 52 mm of mercury, and HCO3 of 22 milliequivalents per liter. Which interpretation does the nurse correctly make about these results? A. Metabolic acidosis. B. Metabolic alkalosis. C. Respiratory acidosis. D. Respiratory alkalosis. The correct answer is C. Respiratory acidosis. Rationale Normal pH is 7.35 to 7.45. In a respiratory condition, an opposite effect will be seen between the pH and the PCO2. In this situation, the pH is low, and the PCO2 is increased. In an acidotic condition, the pH is decreased. Therefore, the values identified in the question indicate a respiratory acidosis. The nurse is planning the client assignments for the day. Which is the most appropriate assignment? For the unlicensed assistive personnel. A. A client who requires wound irrigation. B. A client who requires frequent ambulation. C. A client who is receiving continuous tube feeding with tube feedings. D. A client who requires frequent vital signs after a cardiac catheterization. The correct answer is B. A client who requires frequent ambulation. Rationale. The nurse must determine the most appropriate assignment on the basis of the skills of the staff member and the needs of the client. In this case, the most appropriate assignment for the UAP would be to care for the client who requires frequent ambulation. The UAP is skilled in this task. The client who had a cardiac catheterization will require specific monitoring in addition to that of the vital signs. Wound irrigations and tube feedings are not performed by an unlicensed personnel. The nurse enters a client's room and finds the client on the floor. The nurse completes an incident report and the nursing supervisor and healthcare provider are notified of the incident. Which is the next nursing action regarding the incident? A. Place the incident report in the client's chart. B. Make a copy of the incident report for the HCP. C. Document a complete entry in the client's record concerning the incident. D. Document in the client's record that an incident report has been completed. The correct answer is C. Document a complete entry in the client's record concerning the incident. Rationale The incident report is confidential and privileged information, and it should not be copied, placed in the chart, or have any reference made to it in the client's record. The incident report is not a substitute for a complete entry in the client's record concerning the incident. An unconscious client, bleeding profusely, is brought to the emergency department after a serious accident. Surgery is required immediately to save the client's life. With regard to informed consent for the surgical procedure, which is the best action? A. Call the nursing supervisor to initiate a court order for the surgical procedure. B. Try calling the client's spouse to obtain telephone consent before the surgical procedure. 
See, asked the friend, who came with the client to the emergency department, to sign the consent form. D. Transport the client to the operating department immediately, as required by the healthcare provider, without obtaining an informed consent. The correct answer is D. Transport the client to the operating department immediately, as required by the healthcare provider, without obtaining an informed consent. Rationale Generally, there are only two instances in which the informed consent of an adult client is not needed. One instance is when an emergency is present and delaying treatment for the purpose of obtaining informed consent would result in injury or death to the client. The second instance is when the client waives the right to give informed consent. The nurse arrives at work and is told to report to the pediatric unit for the day because the unit is understaffed and needs additional nurses to care for the clients. The nurse has never worked in the pediatric unit. Which is the appropriate nursing action? A. Call the hospital lawyer. B. Call the nursing supervisor. C. Refuse to float to the pediatric unit. D. Report to the pediatric unit and identify tasks that can be safely performed. The correct answer is D. Report to the pediatric unit and identify tasks that can be safely performed. Rationale, floating, is an acceptable legal practice used by hospitals to solve their understaffing problems. Legally the nurse cannot refuse to float unless a union contract guarantees that the nurse can only work in a specified area or the nurse can prove a lack of knowledge for the performance of assigned tasks. When faced with this situation, the nurse should identify potential areas of harm to the client. The nurse enters a client's room and notes that the client's lawyer is present and that the client is preparing a living will. The living will requires that the client's signature be witnessed and the client asks the nurse to witness the signature. Which is the appropriate nursing action? A. Decline to sign the will. B. Sign the will as a witness to the signature only. C. Call the hospital lawyer before signing the will. D. Sign the will clearly identifying credentials and employment agency. The correct answer is A. Decline to sign the will. Rationale, living wills are required to be in writing and signed by the client. The client's signature either must be witnessed by specified individuals or notarized. Many states prohibit any employee from being a witness including the nurse in a facility, in which the client is receiving care. The nurse enters the room and finds the client lying on the floor. The nurse checks the client and then calls the nursing supervisor and the health care provider to inform them of the occurrence. The nurse completes the incident report for which purpose? A. Providing clients with necessary stabilizing treatments b. A method of promoting quality care and risk management c. Determining the effectiveness of interventions in relation to outcomes d. The appropriate method of reporting to local, state, and federal agencies The correct answer is b. A method of promoting quality care and risk management Rationale, proper documentation of unusual occurrences, incidents, accidents, and the nursing actions taken as a result of the occurrence are internal to the institution or agency. Documentation on the incident report allows the nurse and administration to review the quality of care and determine any potential risks present. The nurse observes that a client received pain medication one hour ago from another nurse, but the client still has severe pain. The nurse has previously observed this same occurrence. Based on the Nurse Practice Act, the observing nurse should plan to take which action? A. Report the information to the police. B. Call the impaired nurse organization. C. Talk with the nurse who gave the medication. D. Report the information to a nursing supervisor. The correct answer is D. Report the information to a nursing supervisor. Rationale. Nurse practice acts require reporting the suspicion of impaired nurses. The State Board of Nursing has jurisdiction over the practice of nursing and may develop plans for treatment and supervision. 
This suspicion needs to be reported to the nursing supervisor, who will then report to the Board of Nursing. Options A and B are inappropriate. Option C may cause a conflict. A nurse lawyer provides an education session to the nursing staff regarding client rights. The nurse asks the lawyer to describe an example that may relate to invasion of client privacy. Which nursing action indicates a violation of client privacy? A. Threatening to place a client in restraints. B. Performing a surgical procedure without consent. C. Taking photographs of the client without consent. D. Telling the client that they cannot leave the hospital. The correct answer is C. Taking photographs of the client without consent. Rationale, invasion of privacy takes place when an individual's private affairs are intruded on unreasonably. Threatening to place a client in restraints constitutes assault. Performing a surgical procedure without consent is an example of battery. Not allowing a client to leave the hospital constitutes false imprisonment. The nurse is collecting data from a pregnant client when the client asks the nurse about the purpose of the fallopian tubes. Which is the accurate response the nurse should make? A. Secrete estrogen. B. Are where the fetus develops. C. Are where fertilization occurs. D. Secrete progesterone. The correct answer is C. Are where fertilization occurs. Rationale, each fallopian tube is a hollow muscular tube that transports a mature oocyte for final maturation and fertilization. Fertilization typically occurs near the boundary between the ampulla and the isthmus of the tube. The fetus develops in the uterus. Estrogen is a hormone that is produced by the ovarian follicles, the corpus luteum, the adrenal cortex, and the placenta during pregnancy. Progesterone is a hormone that is secreted by the corpus luteum of the ovary, the adrenal glands, and the placenta during pregnancy. The nurse working in a prenatal clinic reviews a client's chart and notes that the healthcare provider documents that the client has a gynecoid pelvis. The nurse understands that, which is a characteristic of this type of pelvis. A. Not favorable for labor. B. Not normally a female pelvis type. C. A wide pelvis with a short diameter. D. The most favorable for labor and birth. The correct answer is D. The most favorable for labor and birth. Rationale, a gynecoid pelvis is a normal female pelvis and it is the most favorable for successful labor and birth. An android pelvis would not be favorable for labor because of the narrow pelvic planes. An anthropoid pelvis has an outlet that is adequate, with a normal or moderately narrow pubic arch. The platypeloid pelvis has a wide transverse diameter, but the anteroposterior diameter is short, thus making the outlet inadequate. The client asks the nurse about the purpose of the placenta. The nurse plans to respond to the client, knowing which about the placenta. A. Cushions and protects the fetus. B. Maintains the body temperature of the fetus. C. Surrounds the fetus and allows for fetal movement. D. Provides an exchange of nutrients and waste products between the mother and the fetus. The correct answer is D. Provides an exchange of nutrients and waste products between the mother and the fetus. Rationale, the placenta provides an exchange of nutrients and waste products between the mother and the fetus. The amniotic fluid surrounds cushions and protects the fetus and allows for fetal movement. The amniotic fluid also maintains the body temperature of the fetus. The nurse is describing the process of fetal circulation to a client during a prenatal visit. The nurse should tell the client that fetal circulation consists of which? A. Two umbilical veins and one umbilical artery. B. Two umbilical arteries and one umbilical vein. C. Arteries that carry oxygenated blood to the fetus. D. Veins that carry deoxygenated blood to the fetus. The correct answer is B. Two umbilical arteries and one umbilical vein. Rationale. 
blood pumped by the fetus's heart, leaves the fetus through two umbilical arteries. After the blood is oxygenated, it is then returned by one umbilical vein. Arteries carry deoxygenated blood and waste products from the fetus. Veins carry oxygenated blood and provide oxygen and nutrients to the fetus. A nursing student is assigned to a client in labor. The nursing instructor asks the student to describe fetal circulation, specifically the ductus venosus. The instructor determines that the student understands the structure of the ductus venosus if the student states which about the ductus venosus. A. Connects the pulmonary artery to the aorta. B. Is an opening between the right and left atria. C. Connects the umbilical vein to the inferior vena cava. D. Connects the umbilical artery to the inferior vena cava. The correct answer is C connects the umbilical vein to the inferior vena cava. Rationale, the ductus venosus connects the umbilical vein to the inferior vena cava. The, the foramen ovale is a temporary opening between the right and left atria. The ductus arteriosus joins the aorta and the pulmonary artery. During a prenatal visit, the nurse checks the fetal heart rate of a client in the third trimester of pregnancy. The nurse determines that the FHR is normal, if which heart rate is noted. A. 80 beats per minute. B. 100 beats per minute. C. 150 beats per minute. D. 180 beats per minute. The correct answer is C. 150 beats per minute. Rationale. Fetal heart rate depends on gestational age. It is normally 160 to 170 beats per minute during the first trimester, but it slows with fetal growth to 110 to 160 beats per minute near or at term. The nurse is reinforcing teaching to a pregnant woman about the physiological effects and hormone changes that occur during pregnancy. The woman asks the nurse about the purpose of estrogen. The nurse bases the response on which purpose of estrogen? A. It maintains the uterine lining for implantation. B. It stimulates the metabolism of glucose and converts glucose to fat. C. It stimulates uterine development to provide an environment for the fetus and stimulates the breasts to prepare for lactation. D. It prevents the involution of the corpus luteum and maintains the production of progesterone until the placenta is formed. The correct answer is C, it stimulates uterine development to provide an environment for the fetus and stimulates the breasts to prepare for lactation. Rationale, estrogen stimulates uterine development to provide an environment for the fetus and it stimulates the breasts to prepare for lactation. Progesterone maintains the uterine lining for implantation and relaxes all smooth muscle. Human placental lactogen stimulates the metabolism of glucose and converts the glucose to fat. Human chorionic gonadotropin prevents the involution of the corpus luteum and maintains the production of progesterone until the placenta is formed. The client arrives at the prenatal clinic for her first prenatal assessment. The client tells the nurse that the first day of her last menstrual period was October 20, 2021. Using Nagel's rule, the nurse determines the estimated date of birth is which? A. July 12, 2022. B. July 27, 2022. C. August 12, 2022. D. August 27, 2022. The correct answer is B. July 27, 2022. Rationale The accurate use of Nagel's rule requires that the woman have a regular 28-day menstrual cycle. Subtract 3 months from the first day of the last menstrual period, add 7 days, and then adjust the year as appropriate. In this case, the first day of the LMP was October 20, 2021. When you subtract 3 months, you get July 20, 2021. If you add 7 days, you get July 27, 2021. Add 1 year to this, and you get the estimated date of birth of July 27, 2022. 
A pregnant client asks the nurse in the clinic when she will be able to start feeling the fetus move. The nurse responds by telling the mother that fetal movements will be noted between which weeks of gestation? A. Between 6 and 8 weeks gestation. B. Between 8 and 10 weeks gestation. C. Between 10 and 12 weeks gestation. D. Between 16 and 20 weeks gestation. The correct answer is D. Between 16 and 20 weeks gestation. Rationale Quickening is fetal movement that usually first occurs between 16 and 20 weeks gestation. The expectant mother first notices subtle fetal movements during this time, and these gradually increase in intensity. Options A, B, and C are incorrect. These gestational time frames are too early for quickening. The nurse is collecting data from a client who is pregnant with twins. The client has a healthy 5-year-old child who was delivered at 38 weeks and she tells the nurse that she does not have a history of any type of abortion or fetal demise. The nurse should document the GTPAL for this client as which A. G equals 3, T equals 2, P equals 0, A equals 0, L equals 1. B. G equals 2, T equals 1, P equals 0, A equals 0, L equals 1. C. G equals 1, T equals 1, P equals 1, A equals 0, L equals 1. D. G equals 2, T equals 0, P equals 0, A equals 0, L equals 1. The correct answer is B. G equals 2, T equals 1, P equals 0, A equals 0, L equals 1. Rationale Pregnancy outcomes can be described with the GTPAL acronym. G equals gravidity, number of pregnancies, T equals term births, number born after 37 weeks, P equals preterm births, number born before 37 weeks gestation, A equals abortion slash miscarriages, number of abortion slash miscarriages, L equals live births, number of live births or living children. Therefore, a woman who is pregnant with twins and who already has a child has a gravid of two. Because the child was delivered at 38 weeks, the number of preterm births is zero, and the number of term births is one. The number of abortions is zero, and the number of live births is one. A client is being prepared for a thoracentesis. The nurse should assist the client to which position for the procedure. A. Sims position, with the head of the bed flat. B. Prone, with the head turned to the side, supported by a pillow. C. Lying in bed on the affected side, with the head of the bed elevated 45 degrees. D. Lying in bed on the unaffected side, with the head of the bed elevated 45 degrees. The correct answer is D. Lying in bed on the unaffected side, with the head of the bed elevated 45 degrees. Rationale To facilitate the removal of fluid from the chest, the client is positioned sitting on the edge of the bed leaning over a bedside table, with the feet supported on a stool, or lying in bed on the unaffected side, with the head of the bed elevated 45 degrees. The nurse is providing endotracheal suctioning to a client, who is mechanically ventilated, when the client becomes restless and tachycardic. Which action should the nurse take? A. Notify the rapid response team. B. Finish the suctioning as quickly as possible. C. Contact the respiratory department to suction the client. D. Discontinue suctioning until the client is stabilized and monitor vital signs. The correct answer is D. Discontinue suctioning until the client is stabilized and monitor vital signs. Rationale If a client becomes cyanotic or restless or develops tachycardia, bradycardia, or another abnormal heart rhythm, the nurse must discontinue suctioning until the client is stabilized. It is also important to monitor the vital signs and the pulse oximetry. If the client's condition continues to deteriorate, then the respiratory department and healthcare provider may need to be notified. There is no data in the question that indicates that the rapid response team needs to be notified. The nurse is assisting with monitoring the functioning of a chest tube drainage system in a client 
who just returned from the recovery room after a thoracotomy with wedge resection. Which findings should the nurse expect to note? Select all that apply. A. Excessive bubbling in the water seal chamber. B. Vigorous bubbling in the suction control chamber. C. 50 milliliters of drainage in the drainage collection chamber. D. The drainage system is maintained below the client's chest. E. An occlusive dressing is in place over the chest tube insertion site. F. Fluctuation of water in the tube of the water seal chamber during inhalation and exhalation. The correct answers are C. 50 milliliters of drainage in the drainage collection chamber. D. The drainage system is maintained below the client's chest. E. An occlusive dressing is in place over the chest tube insertion site, and F. Fluctuation of water in the tube of the water seal chamber during inhalation and exhalation. Rationale The bubbling of water in the water seal chamber indicates air drainage from the client. This is usually seen when intrathoracic pressure is greater than atmospheric pressure, and it may occur during exhalation, coughing, or sneezing. Excessive bubbling in the water seal chamber may indicate an air leak which is an unexpected finding. The fluctuation of water in the tube in the water seal chamber during inhalation and exhalation is expected. An absence of fluctuation may indicate that the chest tube is obstructed, the lung has re-expanded, or no more air is leaking into the pleural space. Rationale continued, gentle bubbling should be noted in the suction control chamber. A total of 50 milliliters of drainage is not excessive, in a client returning to the nursing unit from the recovery room, however, drainage of more than 70 to 100 milliliters per hour is considered excessive and requires healthcare provider notification. The chest tube insertion site is covered with an occlusive dressing to prevent air from entering the pleural space. Positioning the drainage system below the client's chest allows gravity to drain the pleural space. The nurse is assigned to assist the healthcare provider with the removal of a chest tube. The nurse should reinforce instructing the client to do which during this process. A. Stay very still. B. Exhale forcefully. C. Inhale and exhale quickly. D. Perform Valsalva's maneuver. The correct answer is D. Perform Valsalva's maneuver. Rationale. When the chest tube is removed, the client is asked to perform Valsalva's maneuver, the tube is quickly withdrawn, and an airtight dressing is taped in place. An alternative instruction is to ask the client to take a deep breath and hold the breath while the tube is removed. The nurse is assisting in planning care for a client with a chest tube. The nurse should suggest to include which interventions in the plan. Select all that apply. A. Pin the tubing to the bed linens. B. Be sure all connections remain airtight. C. Be sure all connections are taped and secure. D. Empty the drainage from the drainage collection chamber daily. E. Monitor closely for tubing that is kinked or obstructed by the weight of the client. The correct answers are B. Be sure all connections remain airtight. C. Be sure all connections are taped and secure and E. Monitor closely for tubing that is kinked or obstructed by the weight of the client. Rationale, chest tube tubing is never pinned to the bed linens because this presents the risk of accidental dislodgement of the tube when the client moves. The chest tube system is not opened and emptied because a closed system must be maintained. If the system is opened, lung collapse can occur. The nurse is assigned to assist with caring for a client who has a chest tube. The nurse notes fluctuations of the fluid level in the water seal chamber. Based on this observation, which action would be appropriate? A. Empty the drainage. B. Encourage the client to deep breathe. C. Continue to monitor because this is an expected finding. D. Encourage the client to hold his or her breath periodically. The correct answer is C. Continue to monitor because this is an expected finding. Rationale, the presence of fluctuations in the fluid level in the water seal chamber indicates a patent drainage system. With normal breathing, the water level rises with inspiration and falls with expiration. The apparatus and all connections must remain airtight at all times 
and the drainage is never emptied because of the risk of disruption in the closed system, which can result in lung collapse. Encouraging the client to deep breathe is unrelated to this observation. The client is not told to hold his or her breath. The nurse is assigned to care for a client who has a chest tube. The nurse is told to monitor the client for crepitus. Which method should be used to monitor the client for crepitus? A. Asking the client about pain. B. Checking the respirations hourly. C. Checking the blood pressure every two hours. D. Palpating for the leakage of air into the subcutaneous tissues. The correct answer is D. Palpating for the leakage of air into the subcutaneous tissues. Rationale Subcutaneous emphysema is also known as crepitus. It presents as a puffed up appearance that is caused by the leakage of air into the subcutaneous tissues. It is monitored by palpating and it feels like bubble wrap when palpated. Although options 1, 2, and 3 may be components of the plan of care for a client with a chest tube, these actions will not identify subcutaneous emphysema. The nurse is told that an assigned client will have a fenestrated tracheostomy tube inserted. The nurse should provide the client with which information about this type of tube. A. Enables the client to speak. B. Checking the respirations hourly. C. Prevents the client from speaking. D. Prevents air from being inhaled through the tracheostomy opening. The correct answer is A. Enables the client to speak. Rationale A fenestrated tube has a small opening in the outer cannula that allows some air to escape through the larynx. This type of tube enables the client to speak. The nurse is reinforcing instructions to a hospitalized client with a diagnosis of emphysema about positions that will enhance the effectiveness of breathing during dyspneic episodes. Which position should the nurse instruct the client to assume? A. Side lying in bed. B. Sitting in a recliner chair. C. Sitting up in bed at a 90 degree angle. D. Sitting on the side of the bed, leaning on an overbed table. The correct answer is D. Sitting on the side of the bed, leaning on an overbed table. Rationale Positions that will assist the client with breathing include sitting up and leaning on an overbed table, sitting up and resting with the elbows on the knees, or standing or leaning against the wall. The nurse is gathering data on a client with a diagnosis of tuberculosis. The nurse should review the results of which diagnostic test to confirm this diagnosis. A. Chest X-ray B. Bronchoscopy C. Sputum culture D. Tuberculin skin test. The correct answer is C. Sputum culture. Rationale A definitive diagnosis of TB is confirmed through culture and isolation of Mycobacterium tuberculosis. A presumptive diagnosis is made on the basis of a tuberculin skin test, a sputum smear that is positive for acid fast bacteria, a chest x ray, and histologic evidence of granulomatous disease on biopsy. The nurse is reinforcing home care instructions to a client and family regarding care after cataract removal from the right eye. Which statement made by the client indicates an understanding of the instructions? A. I should not sleep on my left side. B. I should not sleep on my right side. C. I will take aspirin if I have any pain. D. I should not wear my glasses until my surgeon says it is okay. The correct answer is B. I should not sleep on my right side. Rationale After cataract surgery, the client should not sleep on the side of the body that was operated on. Clients should be instructed not to take aspirin or any medications that contain aspirin because of their antiplatelet properties that can increase the risk of bleeding. Acetaminophen can be taken as needed for pain. Clients may wear their glasses. The nurse is preparing to reinforce a teaching plan for a client who is undergoing cataract extraction with intraocular implant. Which home care measures should the nurse include in the plan? 
select all that apply. A. To avoid activities that require bending over. B. To contact the surgeon if eye scratchiness occurs. C. To place an eye shield on the surgical eye at bedtime. D. That episodes of sudden severe pain in the eye are expected. E. To contact the surgeon if a decrease in visual acuity occurs. F. To take acetaminophen for minor eye discomfort. The correct answers are A. To avoid activities that require bending over, C. To place an eye shield on the surgical eye at bedtime, E. To contact the surgeon if a decrease in visual acuity occurs, and F. To take acetaminophen for minor eye discomfort. Rationale After eye surgery, some scratchiness and mild eye discomfort may occur in the operative eye and is usually relieved by mild analgesics. If the eye pain becomes severe, the client should notify the surgeon because this may indicate hemorrhage, infection, or increased intraocular pressure. The nurse would also instruct the client to notify the surgeon of purulent drainage, increased redness, or any decrease in visual acuity. The client is instructed to place an eye shield over the operative eye at bedtime to protect the eye from injury during sleep and to avoid activities that increase intraocular pressure, such as bending over. The nurse is assisting in developing a teaching plan for the client with glaucoma. Which instruction should the nurse suggest to include in the plan of care? A. Decrease the amount of salt in the diet. B. Decrease fluid intake to control the intraocular pressure. C. Avoid reading the newspaper and watching television. D. I medications will need to be administered for the rest of your life. The correct answer is D. I medications will need to be administered for the rest of your life. Rationale The administration of eye drops is a critical component of the treatment plan for the client with glaucoma. The client needs to be instructed that medications will need to be taken for the rest of his or her life. Limiting fluids and reducing salt will not decrease intraocular pressure. Option C is not necessary. The nurse is assigned to care for a client with a detached retina. Which findings should the nurse expect to be documented in the client's record? A. Blurred vision. B. Pain in the affected eye. C. A yellow discoloration of the sclera. D. A sense of a curtain falling across the field of vision. The correct answer is D. A sense of a curtain falling across the field of vision. Rationale, a characteristic clinical manifestation of retinal detachment described by clients is the feeling that a shadow or curtain is falling across the field of vision. There is no pain associated with detachment of the retina. A retinal detachment is an ophthalmic emergency, and even more so if visual acuity is still normal. Options A and C are not specifically associated with a detached retina. A client arrives in the emergency department after an automobile crash. The client's forehead hit the steering wheel and a high FEMA has been diagnosed. Which position should the nurse prepare to position the client? A. Flat on bed rest. B. On bed rest in a semi-fowler's position. C. In lateral position on the unaffected side. D. In the lateral position on the affected side. The correct answer is B, on bed rest, in a semi-fowler's position. Rationale, a high FEMA, is the presence of blood in the anterior chamber. It is produced when a force is sufficient to break the integrity of the blood vessels in the eye. It can be caused by direct injury, such as penetrating injury from a BB pellet, or indirectly, such as from striking the forehead on a steering wheel during an accident. The client is treated by bed rest, in a semi-fowler's position, to assist gravity in keeping the high femur away from the optical center of the cornea. The nurse is assigned to care for a client with a diagnosis of detached retina, which finding would indicate that bleeding has occurred as a result of retinal detachment. A. Total loss of vision. B. A reddened conjunctiva. C. A sudden sharp pain in the eye. D. Complaints of a burst of black spots or floaters. 
The correct answer is D. Complaints of a burst of black spots or floaters. Rationale Complaints of a sudden burst of black spots or floaters indicate that bleeding has occurred as a result of the detachment. Options A, B, and C are not specifically associated with bleeding as a result of detached retina. A client sustains a contusion of the eyeball after a traumatic injury with a blunt object. The nurse should take which immediate action? A. Notify the health care provider. B. Apply ice to the affected eye. C. Irrigate the eye with cool water. D. Accompany the client to the emergency department. The correct answer is B. Apply ice to the affected eye. Rationale, treatment for a contusion begins at the time of injury. Ice is applied immediately. The client should receive a thorough eye examination to rule out the presence of other eye injuries. Eye irrigation is not indicated in a contusion. Options A and D will delay immediate treatment. After the application of ice, the HCP would be notified. A client sustains a chemical eye injury from a splash of battery acid. The nurse should prepare the client for which immediate measure? A. Checking visual acuity. B. Covering the eye with a pressure patch. C. Swabbing the eye with antibiotic ointment. D. Irrigating the eye with sterile normal saline. The correct answer is D. Irrigating the eye with sterile normal saline. Rationale, emergency care, after a chemical burn to the eye includes irrigating the eye immediately with sterile normal saline or ocular irrigating solution. The irrigation should be maintained for at least 10 minutes. After this emergency treatment, visual acuity is assessed. Options B and C are not immediate measures. The nurse is caring for a client after enucleation and notes the presence of bright red drainage on the dressing. The nurse should take which appropriate action? A. Document the finding. B. Continue to monitor vital signs. C. Report the finding to the healthcare provider. D. Mark the drainage on the dressing and monitors for any increase in bleeding. The correct answer is C. Report the finding to the healthcare provider. Rationale. If the nurse notes the presence of bright red drainage on the dressing, it must be reported to the health care provider because this can indicate hemorrhage. Options A, B, and D will delay necessary treatment. A client is diagnosed with glaucoma. Which data gathered by the nurse indicate a risk factor associated with glaucoma? A. Cardiovascular disease. B. A history of migraine headaches. C. Frequent urinary tract infections. D. Frequent upper respiratory infections. The correct answer is A. Cardiovascular disease. Rationale, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, diabetes mellitus, and obesity are associated with the development of glaucoma. Smoking, ingestion of caffeine, or large amounts of alcohol, illicit drugs, corticosteroids, Altered hormone levels, posture, and eye movements may cause varying transient increases in intraocular pressure. After a tonsillectomy, the child begins to vomit bright red blood. Which is the initial nursing action? A. Turn the child to the side. B. Notify the health care provider. C. Administer the prescribed antiemetic. D. Maintain nothing by mouth status. The correct answer is A. Turn the child to the side. Rationale, after a tonsillectomy, if bleeding occurs, the child is turned to the side and then the HCP is notified. An NPO status would be maintained and an antiemetic may be prescribed, however, the initial nursing action would be to turn the child to the side. The nurse reinforces instructions to the mother of a child with croup about the measures to take if an acute spasmodic episode occurs. Which statement by the mother indicates the need for further teaching? A. I will place a steam vaporizer in my child's room. B. 
I will take my child out into the humid night air. C. I will place a cool mist humidifier in my child's room. D. I will place my child in a closed bathroom and allow my child to inhale steam from the running water. The correct answer is A. I will place a steam vaporizer in my child's room. Rationale Steam from warm running water in a closed bathroom and cool mist from a bedside humidifier are effective for reducing mucosal edema. Cool mist humidifiers are recommended as compared with steam vaporizers, which present a danger of scalding burns. Taking the child out into the humid night air may also relieve mucosal swelling. Remember, however, that a cold mist may precipitate bronchospasm. The nurse reinforces instructions to the mother of a child who has been hospitalized with croup. Which statement made by the mother would indicate the need for further teaching? A. I will give my child cough syrup if a cough develops. B. During an attack, I will take my child to a cool location. C. I can give acetaminophen if my child develops a fever. D. I will be sure that my child drinks at least three to four glasses of fluids every day. The correct answer is A. I will give my child cough syrup if a cough develops. Rationale Cough syrups and cold medicines are not to be given because they may dry and thicken secretions. During a croup attack, the child can be taken to a cool basement or garage. Acetaminophen is used if a fever develops. Adequate hydration of 500 to 1000 milliliters of fluids daily is important for thinning secretions. The nurse is working in the emergency department and is caring for a child who has been diagnosed with epiglottitis, which is an indication that the child may be experiencing airway obstruction. A. Nasal flaring and bradycardia. B. A low-grade fever and complaints of a sore throat. C. The child thrusts the chin forward and opens the mouth. D. The child leans backward, supporting himself or herself with the hands and arms. The correct answer is C. The child thrusts the chin forward and opens the mouth. Rationale Clinical manifestations that are suggestive of airway obstruction include tripod positioning, nasal flaring, tachycardia, a high fever, and a sore throat. After a tonsillectomy, which fluid or food item would be appropriate to offer to the child? A. Yellow Jello. B. Cold Ginger Ale. C. Vanilla Pudding. D. Cherry Popsicle. The correct answer is A. Yellow Jello. Rationale After a tonsillectomy, clear, cool liquids should be administered. Citrus, carbonated, and extremely hot or cold liquids need to be avoided because they may irritate the throat. Milk and milk products are avoided because they coat the throat and cause the child to clear the throat, thus increasing the risk of bleeding. Red liquids need to be avoided because they give the appearance of blood if the child vomits. The medication prescribed is digoxin, 0.25 mg orally, daily. The medication label reads digoxin, 0.125 mg per one tablet. The nurse should prepare how many tablet to administer the dose. A. 1 tablet. B. 2 tablets. C. 3 tablets. D. 4 tablets. The correct answer is B. 2 tablets. Rationale The formula for this question is desired times quantity over on hand equals to tablets per dose. So in this question, desired is 0.25 mg, quantity is 1 tablet, on hand is 0.125 mg. You plug these numbers into the formula. So 0.25 mg times 1 tablet over 0.125 mg equals to 2 tablets. The medication prescribed is heparin sodium, 650 units subcutaneously, every 12 hours. The medication vial reads heparin sodium, 1000 units per 1 milliliter. The nurse prepares how many milliliters to administer one dose. A. 6.50 milliliters. 
B. 0.65 milliliters. C. 650 milliliters. D. 6,500 milliliters. The correct answer is B. 0.65 milliliters. Rationale: The formula for this question is desired times quantity over on hand equals to milliliter per dose. So in this question, desired is 650 units, quantity is 1 milliliter, on hand is 1,000 units. You plug these numbers into the formula, so 650 units times 1 milliliter over 1,000 units equals to 0.65 milliliters. The nurse is instructing the mother of a child with cystic fibrosis about the appropriate dietary measures. Which meal best illustrates the most appropriate diet for a client with cystic fibrosis? A. Veggie salad and a caramel apple. B. Strawberry jelly sandwich and pretzels. C. Plate of nachos and cheese and a cupcake. D. Chicken tenders and a baked potato with butter. The correct answer is D. Chicken tenders and a baked potato with butter. Rationale Children with CF are managed with a high calorie, high protein diet. Pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy is undertaken, and fat soluble vitamin supplements are administered. Fats are not restricted, unless steatorrhea cannot be controlled by increased levels of pancreatic enzymes. Chicken tenders and a baked potato with butter provide a high calorie and high protein meal that includes fat. The nurse reviews the results of a tuberculin skin test performed on a three-year-old child. The results indicate an area of induration that measures 10 millimeters. How should the nurse interpret this result? A. Positive. B. Negative. C. Inconclusive. D. Definitive, requiring a repeat test. The correct answer is A. Positive. Rationale, an induration that measures 10 millimeters or more is considered to be a positive result for children who are younger than 4 years old and for those with chronic illness or with a high risk for environmental exposure to tuberculosis. A reaction of 5 millimeters or more is considered to be a positive result for those in the highest risk groups. The nurse should place the child who had a tonsillectomy in which position? A. Supine position. B. Side lying position. C. High Fowler's position. D. Trendelenburg's position. The correct answer is B. Side lying position. Rationale The child should be placed in a semi prone or side lying position after tonsillectomy to facilitate drainage. Options A, C, and D will not achieve this goal. The medication prescribed is hydromorphone hydrochloride, 3 mg intramuscularly, every 4 hours as needed. The medication label reads hydromorphone hydrochloride, 4 mg per 1 ml. The nurse should prepare to administer how many ml to the client? A. 0.70 ml. B. 0.50 ml. C. 0.75 ml. D. 0.80 ml. The correct answer is C. 0.75 ml. Rationale The formula for this question is desired times quantity over on hand equals to milliliter per dose. So in this question, desired is 3 mg, quantity is 1 milliliter, on hand is 4 mg. You plug these numbers into the formula. So 3 mg times 1 ml over 4 mg equals to 0.75 ml. The intravenous prescription is 1000 ml of 0.9% sodium chloride to run over 12 hours. The drop factor is 15 drops per 1 ml. The nurse plans to adjust the flow rate to how many drops per minute. Round the answer to the nearest whole number. A. 18 drops per minute. B. 19 drops per minute. C. 20 drops per minute. D. 21 drops per minute. 
The correct answer is D, 21 drops per minute. Rationale, the prescribed 1000 milliliters is to be infused over 12 hours. Follow the formula and multiply 1000 milliliters by 15. Then divide the result by 720 minutes. The infusion is to run at 20.8 or 21 drops per minute. That's all I have for this video. Please like, share, let me know if you have any questions. If not, I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.